one until you see five leaves. When you see five leaves, then you take it at a 45 degree angle right above that fifth leaf. That's where you take it off. Yeah. If you're planning on cutting them to put them into a vase for an arrangement inside, does it matter how far down you go? No. Okay. Just take off your bouquet if you're doing it. And then, uh, again, follow the five leaf rule. Okay. Uh, the only other thing I know about them is you don't want to deadhead them if you like to look at the uh, rose hips. Because if you deadhead them, then you won't get hit. Some people like a whole lot of rose hips because they make rose hip teas and stuff like that. I don't bother with that, but that's that trick. When's the best time of year to April for roses. Yeah, get them thrown down nice and then they'll all come up. And then if you need some last minute shaping in June, that's fine. So this time of year? I wouldn't, uh, do what? the only thing I do this time of year is take off the real wild and crazy ones. Okay. And most of mine are in a nice shape right now. They're about as tall as I am. I have some that are shooting up a wild hair. I'll take it off. Just because I like the way it looks. So, so they'll survive through the yeah, snow. Yeah, they will. my first year was that I they will. have some knockoffs. Right. Them. Just and, let them And uh, remember, too, roses have kind of a tough time in Colorado. Do they? Um, and I'll read you from the extension center what it says. Um, the best way to grow them is in full sun with well drained soil, good air circulation. Um, all types of roses need at least one inch of water a week. So like this summer, that was a trick to get them one inch of water. And if you were on city water, that's kind of expensive. Uh, fertilize them with an all-purpose fertilizer. I use my compost, but in the spring I also use specific rose fertilizer. Uh, every four weeks. They need, they're hungry and they need to be fed every month. So I just make a uh, mental note that the first Sunday of every month is when my roses get their inch of water for sure. Every week they get it on Sunday and the first Sunday they get food. Um, let's see, then the only other thing uh, was just pruning is an all season activity with modern hybrid roses as if you're not going to hurt them if you want to reshape them. And uh, if you need more information, uh, the Colorado University Extension Center in Delta always has great information about anything. Uh, they saved my grapes this year because uh, I had no idea we got that big frost in October and uh, in the spring I thought. My grapes were dead, they didn't come up, they were, they looked, my whole arbor was dead as a door. And I went down there and they said, you've probably got good roots. They just got, you know, a lot of the wineries lost their grapes. They said, don't tear them out, just prune them way down and water them, and they'll probably come back. Sure enough, about two months ago, they all started coming up. And um, I started with three, now I have five. So they did have a good root system. But uh, the extension center is a marvelous place to get information. So that's that. Don't be heartbroken if your uh, beautiful hybrid rose turns into a climber. Almost all hybrid roses are grafted onto climber roots. And every now and then that climber root will take over. Um, and when it does, just Either enjoy your new climber or take it out and put in another hybrid. I have one right now in the corner that's both. It's a beautiful yellow tea rose surrounded by the climber that it was originally grafted onto. Uh, so that, that's what happens occasionally. I don't know unless you were part of a rose society that could order guaranteed hybrid roses that had hybrid roses for parents if you'd ever get one that wasn't grafted onto a climber. Anyway, that's just for you to know. Don't feel bad if that happens. Just start over again. Now we will move from uh, 
Does anybody have any other questions about roses? Yeah. I have a question. The roses, they did great this summer, and, and now they're getting powdery melted. Why? Is it because it's gotten cooler? There's been some moisture? Powdery mildew can seem to attack any plant anytime for whatever reason. Most commonly it hits zinnias oh, and uh, oh, the newcomer yeah. plants. Uh, but if it's hitting your roses, all I know is uh, that you can try, may help, may not, is put 50-50 uh, water and milk into a spray bottle and spray it. Oh. Uh, spray it with milk. It may stop it. Me not. Hmm. Oh, no. Okay. That's all I know about powdery oh, milk. No. Yeah. Oh, no. I use two percent milk. Well, well, that's interesting. Yeah, because they did fine. It I took it off of my uh, uh, moist. It started in on my cucumbers, and I oh. sprayed it with uh, okay. the fifty fifty milk and water, and it stopped it. I'll be done. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll go on to deer proofing your yard. <laughs> the guy <laughs> that was in here. <laughs> <laughs> that works for the city, not the deer up in my scene is up there where the deer are very aggressive and eat everything. Uh, what I have found in the last six years is, for the most part, the deer will leave your iris alone. So you can plant iris. Uh, I prefer to plant iris in a clump. They're more showy than if you just stick them one at a time. Uh, when they get too full, tight in that clump, you want to separate them out. But uh, that's another whole lesson on separating bulbs. But iris are a great uh, plant, especially in a clump of six or eight. I like to put them in a clump, surround them with some colored gravel and some rocks, and then let them produce their beautiful bouquet. Um, they don't last long enough to suit anybody. The blossoms are so gorgeous in the spring. But after the blossoms are gone, the foliage itself it is beautiful too, and it's a good filler. Um, and I leave that until right about now. Uh, in September, the leaves will start to turn yellow and fall down and, and lay down. That's their signal to you that they are through sending nourishment to the rhizomes and they are now ready to be clipped off. And you can clip them up three, four inches high with a pair of scissors. And then they'll come back in the spring. And uh, I love iris. I've got beautiful iris all the way around the perimeter of my yard. Um, they don't care if they're in partial shade. They love the sun. Uh, and like I say, they'll, they fill in all the the empty spots that you want something pretty. When you cut the, the split blossom, do you just cut it where the blossom is or do you cut it all the way down? No, I take the whole stem off okay. that has a blossom on it okay. and then leave the foliage just right. to look pretty and green. Okay. Uh, so iris are a mainstay. The daylilies are gorgeous and the deer don't like daylilies either. The, Almost all the perennials that I have planted, uh, I have planted for a reason. They're showy, they have a beautiful blossom, uh, they get bigger and bigger, and as they have their, usually they're making their babies from their perimeter, you can shuffle them off and keep moving them around. So some of the plants that I got when I first came here from friends of mine here, they would give me, for instance, a clump of iris or a clump of uh, sedum, um, a clump of uh, cornflowers, whatever. If you split them, you know, and then you can just keep having more and more and more. And I, I love that, getting a solid perimeter of perennials around my yard so I'm not going to have to keep planting forever. They're just there. And now I'm at the point, 10 years later, where I don't have room for it anymore, I can start giving them as gifts, um, asking people to come over and help themselves because I, I like to keep them contained. You can only have a, a cluster of virus. My, my favorite size is about like this. So when they get like this, I take the edges off and give them to somebody. The day lilies I love um, just because it 
It's fun to have uh, kind of stair-stepping blooms. It starts in the spring, and the first thing you're going to get is daffodils. The deer don't like daffodils either, so you can have as many different varieties of daffodils as you want. Now is the time to plan from now until the ground is frozen. Get those bulbs in now, and you'll be so happy you did in the spring. And the first thing they come up, they look beautiful, and the deer will not eat them. Can't say that about tulips. If you have a tulip in the yard, you're asking for a deer to come in and rip it up and eat the bulb and everything. So I love tulips, but I confine my love of tulips to buying them key at the store and putting them on my tiny room table. Um, but stair stepping, starting with the daffodils would be the first thing. And then after the daffodils, here come the iris. And then after the iris, here come the daylilies. So there's always something starting to bloom as something is stopping, and that's what's fun. Um, the sedum, this is not a good picture of them. I wish that you all would take my uh, invitation to come by my yard at any time, whether I'm home or not, and walk around and look, look at the sedum. They are in their glory right now. Um, they get to be about this big around. Uh, they're this tall. I have a whole row of them uh, on the right side of my driveway. If you come in, you go all the way to the back. They're, they're in front of my uh, grape arbor. When they first come up, they have a blossom that looks kind of like a, the head of a broccoli. It's uh, green. And then, uh, that's May, June. About July, they start turning pink. They're beautiful pale pink. And then as soon as we get some cool mornings, like now, they turn into a rusty red. And they'll stay that rusty red color until they get snow brown. Uh, but they're just beautiful, and they're tough. They're drought resistant. Uh, they don't care whether they're in the sun or the shade. They'll do better in the sun, but I've, I've got them everywhere now where I needed a spot of color because they're just so hardy and tough and the deer don't eat them, and uh, they're, they're just wonderful. And I would give any one of you a piece of sedum to start. They grow, uh, you can take an edge off of one even after your first year, and then you'll have two, and then you'll have four. I started with one, and now I have about 25. And you said the deer don't like them? And the deer don't eat them. Yeah, I'm so, I can't see you. Which one is the sedum? Uh, sedum. This is not a good picture of it. Uh, you need to come and, and, and look in person as I see them. I live at 928 Southwest Brooklyn. It's real easy to find my house. Uh, you just go down the highway and go west on 11th Avenue, which is across from the car wash, and go down West Avenue past the little white church, and on the first street on the left, Brooklyn. Come down to Brooklyn, five houses, and that's 928. 928. 928 Southwest Brooklyn. And you can come anytime and walk around my yard, whether I'm there or not. Thank you. Um, zinnias, the deer don't eat the zinnias. They're not a perennial, except they will reseed themselves, so you would kind of call them a perennial. Just like the snapdragons. If you buy a, a six-pack of snapdragons at the greenhouse and put them in and just water them and, and feed them and, and deadhead them, uh, letting the seeds fall to the ground, they'll reseed themselves and they act like a perennial, even though they're an annual. And uh, I've had the same snapdragons coming up for the last five years, uh, and they, they add a lot of nice color. And the same with the zinnias, they'll reseed themselves. The cone flowers, I especially like the little uh, pink ones. Uh, the deer don't eat them, and they, they come back every year. Keep mm -hmm. in mind that sometimes uh, you like to stair step your garden so that, you know, when you're looking at it, you don't want tall things in front of short things. So the, in the back is where I have the iris because they'll get to be this tall. And then I'll put the cone flowers in front of those. And then 
the snapdragons in front of those. So it's kind of terraced down as far as the color that you see. Yeah. Do you deadhead the coneflowers at the end of their growing season, or do you leave them for the uh, for the birds for the winter? Right now, um, they're just beginning to look like they need to be deadheaded, and they aren't too pretty once they lose all their color. I just turn them down, turn them down, just about to this height. Dutch iris are only about a foot tall, um, and they have a beautiful little purple blossom. Some of them are yellow, and they're more of like a grass with a few blossoms. But they're a nice filler. Again, if you've got a lot of stuff, a lot of ground that you need to fill, uh, I have chosen to fill most of my perimeter with big rocks and trees and then I don't have too much left to fill with flowers. Um, I have put rock gardens under all my trees because nothing else will grow under a tree anyway. But the rocks, uh, I should stop and say this about rocks. My feeling about rocks is if I don't want to water it or mow it or weed it, I put a rock on And And rocks are beautiful and there's tons of them all around here. Doesn't take long. One little trip up Surface Creek Road, you can find somebody that'll let you haul rocks out of their ditch. But um, and I'm offering rocks if you need. Yeah, eight <laughs> acres of rocks and cedar. And it's yes, fun to, get to uh, <laughs> like my pine trees, especially. I have several pine trees. Uh, pine trees have a very shallow root system. Have you ever seen when the wind has blown a pine tree over? It's just a very shallow root system. Um, it breaks my heart to see many times a dead, beautiful pine near new construction where they have put too much dirt over that root system and it kills it because their roots are so close to the surface. Problem with that is the root system around the pine tree will fight with the grass for the water. So you can't, you, you can't water it enough to support the grass and the tree. So because of that, I have put a rock garden under all of my pine trees. And uh, that's turned out to be, under one pine tree, all I have is rock, flat rock with gravel between the cracks to give it some mulch because rock will hold the water in. And uh, with the strong wind that we have around here, I like to think that that rock mulch is going to help stabilize it and keep it from being blown over. Uh, but also, uh, around the huge cottonwood I have, that's enormous, it's probably 100 years old, uh, I've put a huge rock garden around the base of it also. I love rock gardens at the base of the tree. Uh, and, and they're just beautiful. Uh, Another one, I have put a perimeter of brick and then filled in over uh, around the, the root system with just the pine straw and pine cones that fall off of it. Uh, and that's another nice mulch for it. Keeps the ground cooler. When you water it, the pine cones hold the water for it and it, and it looks attractive. Yes. I just remembered something uh, that I was in your neighborhood last year doing some work, and there was a little box next to the road full of these uh, bronzy colored iris. And I took them because they were next to the road, and I thought, oh, maybe that came from your yard. Do you put them next to the road? Just in uh, the box? No, my neighbor was putting some out. Oh, okay. she was thinning her iris and putting a box out. Oh, okay. Um, oh, but the lady said they're on the side of the road, take them. Well, yeah. I think they're on the side of the road. Yeah. yeah. And I was so a lot of people do that. Because yeah. yeah. they did. I've never grown iris and they came up, but I was like, oh, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they make you feel so good because they are so beautiful and they smell so beautiful. And I have every color in the rainbow now, mostly the purple ones. Um, and I'll have some extra ones this year if anybody wants some iris. I <laughs> think so. One thing the deer don't eat. Deer they kill my daylilies. They mush them really down to my nuts. Really in between some boulders. I had never had a deer touch one of my daylilies. Yeah, I had read that they wouldn't bother them, but I caught some. 
this big around and I took it off the side of a cliff with a chain and pulled it off with my pickup truck <laughs> and got it into the back of the pitchfork without touching it. And then all you have to do to transplant them is just dig a shallow hole, sprinkle some cactus potting soil in there, fill it with water, drop that baby in and it's going to take off. You must have some pretty sturdy thick gloves to do this. I don't use you don't touch it. I, I have leather gloves, but I don't touch the plant. I handle it with my pitchfork. Yeah. Yep. And the way to weed them, uh, because I don't know anybody in this town that doesn't fight with uh, by weed. I had some in my cactus. In both, I have a mission cactus and a prickly pear. I found out that you can take one of those long-handled dandelion diggers. Just put it in at the base of that bindweed and start turning the handle, and it'll wind around it, and then you can pull that. <laughs> so that's how I weed a cactus. So, these so bindweed has about a 15 foot root system. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's good yeah. to pull it like that, of course, but. Uh, just, I can kill it. Uh, I've killed it along my fence line. Um, the people up at uh, Ace Hardware gave me a recipe on what will kill bindweed. It's a 50-50 it's a solution of Roundup and this other um, stuff that they use. It stinks. Yep. Yep. Oh, 2,4-D. Yeah, yeah, 50-50. And then spray it with that, and within 24 hours, you can see it turn yellow. I, I've rocked in all my fence lines to keep from having to deal with it so much. Uh, now I just have to walk down my fence line once or twice a year, and and spray my rocks with some weed killer, but it was worth the effort of bringing in all that rock in. My husband loves to take me rock, and so I get a permit from the BLM to go collect rock. We go out to the canyon, and I pick it up and bring it in, and I probably have about 36 truckloads of rock now on our property, and uh, he just tells people, when you get to our block, look for the house on the hill. <laughs> Because of all the rock I brought in, you think we're on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> so just one last thing on the bindweed, like, uh, because it is a, uh, I'll just tell you all, I, I, guess I just retired from doing weed control for 20 years, but it's a deep-rooted plant, mm -hmm. so right now is a good time to do a treatment on it. If you want to. But I, I used it uh, around it on it as well. I never treated it in my own yard, you know, and it killed it. I mean, it, it pretty good, but I don't know if it's if it's a permanent fix because Roundup typically doesn't work yeah. that way, uh, mm -hmm. going to the root. But um, have you found that it's just a permanent fix in the yard? Um, well, this was the first year I used that solution, and so far it seems to be working. So we'll see. It's a constant fight. Um, my garden and everything is pretty much this, my vegetables and strawberries and all of that are in raised beds. So I haven't had to deal with weeds because I just learned that in Alaska that it's easier to raise stuff in a raised bed and you're not walking on it and you don't have weeds and it's easier all, over, all that. Um, so we've talked also of uh, peonies are beautiful. They do well in Colorado and uh, the deer don't eat peonies. Mm. Uh, they don't like peonies? No, nope, they don't. Yeah, they uh, the Russian sage. They don't eat that. So you can have a gorgeous yard uh, with plants that the deer don't eat. And uh, then if you have a fence, put a high rail around your roses. Uh, I have finally, after 10 years of landscaping, got my property the way I wanted it. I love it. I've done a desert garden on the right side, a cactus garden out the front. And my vegetables are in the back, but uh, like I said, you're all invited to come by and take a look and see if there's something you like. I'd be glad to share it with you. Uh, That's so generous I, because it's kind of expensive to go and buy plants. Oh, yes, it is. I couldn't yeah. believe it. When I went to the greenhouse, I was looking for a particular plant because I have one spot that's in 24 7 shade mm -hmm. and nothing would grow there. And I thought, I'll go down there and ask my buddy down there if they have.
have anything that that's pretty that loves 24 hours of shade. And there was one plant that I'm testing to see if it'll live. But uh, while I was there, I noticed I could not believe one one little perennial was like 16 bucks, or one little rhubarb, or one little iris, twelve dollars. Holy cow! I must have fifty thousand dollars worth of stuff in my house. But it's all propagated itself and grown. And uh, I got all of my stuff from friends at church and people that my neighbors that just wanted to share. They started me with one beautiful thing, and now I have like twenty of them. So many that I've been able to give them to other neighbors, and um, so I'm happy to share with you too. If you want to come by and you see something you like, I'll just bring a shovel and a pot, and I'll give you some. Now is a good time to transplant many things because we're getting ready to button up for the winter. Now we said that I would finish up with questions and answers and how to button up for the winter. I think everything. Uh, in the springtime when you're planting stuff, uh, because of our heat and lack of water, our stuff likes to be mulched. And I mulch with compost and leaves and rock. In the winter, uh, to protect your things, you need to mulch also. And most of us have leaves. If you don't have leaves, I would ask a neighbor that has excess and you can have a couple of bags of theirs. Because leaves are a wonderful mulch. They'll keep things from freezing, and they'll gradually break down and become dirt, so uh, no must, no fuss. Excess leaves, I have excess leaves because I have 26 trees. Uh, a couple of cottonwoods that never quit dropping leaves. But I, I mow them up with my mower so that I have a catcher full of chopped leaves. And those go into a huge pile. Um, it's a chicken wire cage actually that I use as part of my compost recipe. So I save all of my top leaves so I get a year's supply this time of year. All leaves. Bagged up. There's all leaves. Little leaves. Little leaves. The only there. thing the only thing I don't like in my compost is pine needles. And I get a lot of pine needles uh, after a uh, wind or a rain because I have a couple of beautiful huge pine trees. So I rake those up and dispose of them or use them as uh, uh, walking path stuff. So there isn't any leaf that causes too much acid or something as well? All these are okay for mold? Uh, I haven't dealt with it. Um, the one year that I tried to grow blueberries realized with some soil testing that my I was too acid. Uh, they like acid soils. So I tried to bring them orange juice. That didn't work. Uh, I just gave up on you can buy blueberries cheaper than you can buy blueberry plants. But um, for the most part, my compost has been my answer. Uh, by composting, and, and I learned how to do that in Alaska, I can feed my roses, feed my lilacs, feed my vegetables, feed all my fruit, feed my lawn. I don't have to buy six or seven different products. Everybody just gets compost and everybody loves it. Uh, roses and iris and lilacs especially like compost. And I make it with a standard recipe of a layer of leaves, a layer of grass clippings, a layer of kitchen garbage produce, coffee grams, eggshells, um, and a or another layer of grass clippings, another layer of leaves until I have a cage this tall. It takes me about a month to build a cage of compost, and then it gets turned over at the end of the month into another cage. And it sits there for a month, and then it gets turned over into another cage. And then it sits there for a month. And when it gets to the fourth cage, at the end of three months then, <coughs> that is ready for me to screen into my big barrels, my big 33 gallon barrels. What that cage will give me about three barrels of beautiful potting soil. It's all ready at that time. Just And it's easy because I only have to toss it once a month as I'm moving each thing along. Right now, it's the middle of the month almost, so I'm starting to screen cage number four. So 
so that it'll be empty so that at the end of the month I can turn the other three over. So but you don't, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, you don't, um, can, you don't, your grass clippings when you're mowing, you just keep those or do you get them from somebody else? No, I, I keep all my grass clippings go into my compost. If I have more than what will give me a six inch layer, I just throw it into the chicken yard for my hens. Um, but, uh, and I've got that stockpile of chopped leaves that, and when I'm mowing the grass right now, I'm getting chopped leaves in with it. That, that's great. But uh, the compost is wonderful. It creates worms. If you don't have worms in your soil, it means it's not rich enough. And, but after you till compost into it, um, you'll, you'll get worms. Do you have to chop the leaves? Because we're done with lawn mowing and our compost drop leaves. You can just use whole leaves. leaves. I just like to oh. mow them. Okay. I, when, I, when my lawn yeah, is covered with leaves, <laughs> I take my lawn mower and chop them up. Gotcha. Catch them in my catcher. It's easier than raking. Yes. I keep mowing until it snows. I take it the leaves up. And do you keep the compost wet? And Whenever I'm drink? watering, uh, like in the morning, when I go out to let my hens out, and they have a little yard in my hen house, and I let them out to play for the day, uh, and I take my hose and I fill that water dishes. And while I'm doing that, I spray. I give the, the compost a little spray, but not much. It, it gets the rain, and I can tell when I toss it at the end of the month if it's too dry. I will uh, wet it down while I'm tossing it. Uh, otherwise, I don't add any more water. Do so you cover your compost at all? No. And so it's it gets all the rain. Just let it have snow. I want it to get all the rain in the snow. Okay. That's kind of great. Yep, it works good. Boy, by the time I get to that fourth cage, it's, it's beautiful. If you come by and I'm home, I can show you how. It's just delicate and dark brown and wonderful. It smells good. I was just concerned about critters because we do throw our grains, kitchen scraps. The only thing I don't it's throw into it, it, it doesn't, uh, I, I never put any dairy or uh, meat, meat, meat or meat. grease. Right. Only vegetables. Yeah, or so eggs. Only too. vegetables. Yeah. You said eggshells. Yeah, a lot of eggshells, okay. coffee grounds. But you don't have a problem with mice or? No, but you know, I think it's because my hens are good mousers. I've seen more than one hen catch a mouse. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we have neighborhood cats, okay. too, that are probably mousers. Not prairie dogs. My goodness. Never had a prairie dog. Yeah, that didn't work real well. 
you got to do that really early in the spring when you just little grasshoppers. Right, and then do it repeatedly. Yeah, there. And neem, neem oil. You use neem oil online. Really? Neem. Neem. And it's more of a Causes them not to reproduce. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kill them, but they just don't. Again, my chickens are pretty, <laughs> pretty <laughs> good little bugs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, love, grasshoppers I love <laughs> having some eggs, yeah. 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 not just the fresh eggs and the fertilizer, but they, they keep me cricket free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were taken over by grasshoppers in the greenhouse, oh. opened it up, mm -hmm. let the chickens in. I have to see grass yeah. well, okay. yeah. 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 yards. Yeah. 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 Some in a troublesome little garden, and I'm, you know, just been a short time. 
just a couple months. I think the deal we consider. I think we're seven, aren't we? At number seven. Oh gosh, I Cedar Mesa. That one yet. Is, Cedar Mesa, where I live, is higher than Fritchman's, and then I'm just above Fritchman's. We're in another zone, so that's probably seven. Yeah. I think where are you at? What's your elevation? Four oh, sixty-five. It's exactly that, yes. It's okay. on the east, what, east side of Cedar Mesa. So, what do you consider? What zone? The seven. I, you know, I, when I read it, I myself to be in seven. You do. Okay. I had a lady here who lives in town told at the grocery store the other day when I was getting kale. Yes. Uh, told me we're 4B here. Oh, I don't So, I looked on the phone and it says where I live is 6B. So, what's